In a world of ever-evolving technology, we are constantly seeing mind-bending inventions from leading tech companies. Boston Dynamics helper robots and Tesla's push towards fully automated cars were things only seen in science fiction a handful of years ago. One thing that's always amazed me is the progress in artificial intelligence chatbots, being able to have a fully comprehensible conversation with a computer that reacts to what you type both amazes and terrifies me. Microsoft's Tay AI chatbot is a great example of how far we have come, but also how far we have to go with them. So back in 2009, when Lionhead Studios' Peter Molyneux announced an Xbox 360 project called Project Milo, I was intrigued, but also very skeptical, as were most of the time. A project so bold as to be touted as a digital boy that lived on your Xbox. So what happened to that digital little boy? Why haven't we seen the King of Kings and AI chatbots yet? And why didn't he live long enough to become a racist? So, who is Milo? Well, Project Milo, it's also known as Milo and Kate, was for lack of a better description, a tech demo. It was an emotional AI developed by Lionhead Studios. But this isn't where our story actually starts. If we want to talk about the eventual tech demo that was shown at E3 back in 2009, we first have to talk about Dimitri. So let me take you back to 2001, in a place called Elstree in England where some 15 employees of Lionhead Studios gathered in Peter Molyneux's house to discuss a project codenamed Dimitri. One of those employees was programmer Tak Fung, who recalls a question being asked that evening. What kind of game is Dimitri? And what kind of game are we going to do? Throughout the evening, ideas were thrown around for an adventure game built around artificial intelligence. One member suggested a 50s-style America setting with artistic influences from Norman Rockwell and Edward Hopper. Another suggested a Twins Peak influence, and by the end of that evening, they had a plan in place for Dimitri, and development began. Dimitri was named after Molyneux's godson, and it was a game revolving around a high school student who arrives at a new town and quickly has to choose a clique to befriend. It was an interactive drama where players could create their own character and play out a classic adventure game brought forward to a more present setting. The 50s America Twilight Zone setting was established in the meeting at Molyneux's house and it was to be the main focus of this game. Players would play through micro stories, depending on what they did throughout the game. The team built a town that served as a world hub to tie everything together. During the development of Dimitri, the team were constantly moved between other projects at Lionhead. This led to different team members experimenting with different ideas to put their own stamp on it. Lionhead artists Mark Healy and Christian Bravely created a Back to the Future inspired mock-up where a doctor sat the player in the time machine, fired a laser at him, and sent him back through time. We were trying to sell the idea of travelling back and forth in time to mess around with the cause and effect in a small town, to solve various puzzles. We were always going to come up with various ideas to try and convince the rest of the team to focus on something. After four years of development, constant changes, and no real vision anymore, Dimitri halted production. Staff were then pulled away to work on the more successful Fable series, and Dimitri fell lower and lower on the priority list. In 2006, Microsoft purchased Lionhead Studios and officially pulled the plug on Dimitri. Molyneux still liked the idea behind Dimitri, and the idea stuck with him for a while after the cancellation of the game. He wanted to explore a project built on human relationships based on watching his son Lucas growing up and thinking about how he could play that out in an interactive environment. He revisited some of the ideas from the Dimitri project, but with new technology and a change in scenery, changing the 50s America setting to an English countryside setting and a modern day time period all with the sole focus on a single character, Milo. Gary Carr, the executive producer of Lionhead's business simulation, The Movies, jumped on board the project as creative director. The player would serve as Milo's imaginary friend, helping to raise him, build his confidence and teach him games. Lionhead hired people from outside the games industry to work on a story that would include player choices. Film director John Dower and writer Lynn Cochran were brought in to write the narrative that would let the game play out more like a film. Molyneux began talking to the press about the game. This discovery has led us to starting a game, and this game will be forever on the front cover of nature magazines and scientific magazines. It's that significant. I think it's such an incredible thing that we're doing. I think it is... important. 
In 2009, during the Microsoft press conference at E3, then Senior Vice President of Xbox Don Matrick announced Project Nattel, a controllerless, full-body motion control experience to rival the success of the Nintendo Wii. Right before the show was about to conclude, we got one more announcement. Something for the upcoming Project Nattel from Linehead Studios. Now let's see what happens when you put Nattel in the hands of the master, Matrick proclaimed, and then welcomed Linehead CEO Peter Molyneux to the stage. Here we get to hear Peter talk about the upcoming Project Milo, and show off a pre-recorded video of the project. Science fiction writers, filmmakers, they haven't imagined what we're able to do today. We've been experimenting with something here. I'd like you to meet a boy called Milo. He's a character that can recognize us, he can recognize our faces, he can recognize our voices, he can recognize emotions in us. And this is Claire, she's going to introduce you to Milo. Hiya Milo, how are you doing? Hi Claire, you okay? Actually, I'm a bit nervous. You? Nervous? I don't believe it. This is the first time that thousands of people are going to see this. Thousands of people? Here we're seeing Claire being recognised. And the emotion in Claire's voice being recognised. And that emotion reflecting in Milo's face. Those are all being seen for the first time. So listen, I was thinking today you should let me beat you at football again. That is if you finished your homework. You have finished your school project. What okay? happened there is that Claire knew Milo so well, she knew when he was worried about something. The head was down, he wasn't looking at the camera so much, and this is about you meeting a character, a person. Well, why don't I help you with yours? Then yours will be brilliant. Hmm. All right. I could have just tried to catch some fish, draw some pictures in my journal. Maybe I'd do okay this time. I think that's a good idea. Lift off! Oh. <sighs> Don't know till I try, do I? Exactly. See? I've got everything we need. Well, great. Let's get started then. You've got to put these goggles on. Goggles? Put them on like this. Okay. What? Like that? Claire has been thrown a pair of goggles. Notice what she did. This wasn't acted. She felt the need to reach down for those goggles. Now, everybody, every single person that has experienced this reaches down because they feel so connected to Milo's world. Cool. So what are we doing? Do I have to stand at the edge? Go on. Put your hands in. It's not too cold. Ah, I bet the fish think you're a monster. Cheeky. <laughs> Swish the water about a bit. See if you can touch a fish. There Claire is, in Milo's world. She's in that pond. All right. Every hand movement is being recognised. Being able to touch fish, being able to swish the water with her hand. Everyone who's experienced it, the hairs are standing up on the back of their head. Now, what's about to happen is some real magic. Well, you're good at drawing. They're only fish, but they're trickier than you think. Well, here, I'll have a go. Right. I'm going to do a body and a tail, the big fin and a smiley face. There we go. What do you think? Look at what just happened. Orange. Claire That's drew a picture on a piece of paper. The piece of paper was held up to Milo. Natal recognised the piece of paper, scanned the piece of paper in. Milo looked at that piece of paper, recognised the shape, recognised the colour, and able to get on with his project. This is true technology that science fiction has not even written about. And this works today. Now. Back at Linehead Studios, however, programmer Paul Evans watched the presentation from his desk, worrying Molyneux would overpromise on the project. For those of you who are unaware, Peter Molyneux is known for his formidable creative accomplishments and his tendencies to make lofty claims that never quite deliver. But Peter believed in this vision. The team at Lionhead, however, didn't feel the same way. They felt that since Milo wasn't live, people would assume it was fake. And it was. The team hired an actress to record a version of the sequence that would come across as normal on camera. But if you look into the video closer, you can see that even the reflection in the pond doesn't quite match her movements in front of the Kinect. 
She also shows a drawing that she did of a fish that is meant to be scanned by the Kinect for Milo to react to. But it is so quick. I'm not even sure your phone's QR code scanner can pick up on a code that quick, let alone a Kinect running on what looks like to be an Xbox 360 Elite console with an absolute unit of a hard drive on top. Peter, Bubba, where did you get such a girthy hard drive from? You know what I would have done to have something like that back in the day? I had to settle for a whopping 20 gig hard drive for my Xbox 360 Pro model. But back on topic for a second. This is such a red flag. This was meant to be a game released on a disc for this generation's Xbox. This generation's Xbox that had a whopping 512 megabytes of RAM and a triple core CPU. Were we honestly supposed to buy into the fact that this was a machine learning AI tech was going to be stored on this kind of console? Even if it had been cloud-based, the technology back in 2009 for cloud computing wouldn't have been able to contain Milo and his all-powerful mind. And this in turn leads us to our big question. Was this even a game? Was it all just a tech demo, a proof of concept sans the technology for the Kinect? The problem here is, the Kinect would never be able to achieve what Peter and his team at Linehead had in store for Milo. So what tech are we actually demoing here? In 2009, Peter is now the CEO of Linehead Studios and creative director for Microsoft Game Studios Europe, trying his best to blend the newly announced Kinect with his project Milo. But a year later, we would see Milo cancelled. Some Linehead staff blame Microsoft, saying that Phil Spencer's first party publishing team decided to stop the project, stating that Microsoft thought that Milo was too hard of a concept to sell. And I think they're right. The Kinect didn't hold much respect in the gamer universe. It was constantly the butt of jokes from the serious gamers who leaned more favourably with games such as Red Dead Redemption, Mass Effect and Fallout New Vegas, which shared the same release year as Milo's cancellation. People weren't into the idea of having an interactive babysitting simulator with a virtual boy. But that wasn't Peter's intention. He isn't a man who will try to capitalise on current gaming trends. He stays kind of in his own lane and creates wild experiences. Most say that Peter's a snake oil salesman, but I'm not sure it's greed that has his intentions. A major motivation for him, he says, is making his son proud. If I ask people to be interested in Goddess, if there's one reason for them to be interested, it's that I could not do anything that would not make my son proud. He's a gamer, and if I ever make a game where he turns around to me and says, you overpromised that, it would just kill me. These quotes are from a Kotaku article that really goes in depth about how Peter feels about his legacy in the video game industry. I am going a little off script here by saying all this, but I really want to get the point across that Peter's not someone of the video game industry elite who just want to push battle passes out and make sure they can capitalize on every microtransaction possible. I can understand the criticism levied at him, calling him a con man or a snake oil salesman for things he said in the past, but I genuinely think he just overreaches a little bit. Project Milo was definitely one of his bigger ideas that he had, and unfortunately he couldn't come to pass. The biggest roadblock for Milo was obviously the technology. If this were announced today, I would probably hold the same scepticism I had when watching this press reveal back in 2009. AI makes leaps and bounds every year, but it's far from sentient conversation still. Siri can barely tell me if I need a jacket before I leave the house most of the time, so the expectation of something of this magnitude was never really going to be fulfilled. But credit to Peter for being ambitious enough to create the scenario for Milo. The big issue is the video game industry needs visionaries of the here and now, not so much 20 years in the future. This industry revolves around games announced in the summer and released to the Christmas period. We make it our business to rip apart any claim a company makes that doesn't meet our high expectations. Peter unfortunately doesn't fit this criteria. There are countless threads and videos made exposing his lies and unkept promises, and they make for eye-opening reads. It's hard to defend someone with such a track record of doing this, but I think he says it best when he says, the trouble is, I'm a terrible PR person. On the other hand, Maybe he overpromises because in the worlds he wants to create, he wants the player to be able to knock an acorn off a tree and watch it grow into a tree of its own over the course of your playtime in Fable. Alas, that's not just a feasible idea, not even today, let alone in 2005. He's a man thinking, like I said, 20 years in the future and trying to make those ideas work today. Or maybe he just is a great con man, tricking us into buying games with great expectations only to be constantly let down. I think Peter Molyneux has a genuine passion for video games. Something not a lot of people in this industry have anymore. Personally, I think he's a dreamer. Someone who spends way too much of his time with his head in the clouds. But that's not always a bad thing.